the course is designed to be physical course with part, you know um, us teaching and you learning kind of physically but obviously some people cannot come or some people prefer to watch lectures at home and and so on so we will we will kind of do it uh, and I will try to remember to start recording from start. So for J Benjamin to quickly recap, uh, we have no restrictions about IDEs. We have no restrictions about operating systems. And we will um, try to accommodate different people on different um, using different tools. Um, and we will talk a little bit about Golang, but the main two languages in the course are Haskell and Rust. So that's a, a very quick uh, recap. Um, we will use, um, we, we're gonna use, uh, GitLab. So those of you who have been having courses with us, you already know it, uh, and you probably already have a account. So if you go to this page, you will see like a request access button. You, you click it. Uh, and then most of the information will be provided in, um, in GitLab. We also, and, and you kind of need to use it because if you don't want to use it, we really don't have an alternative for sharing code and for uh, doing issue tracker and submissions, right? So it is kind of not mandated by NTNU, strictly speaking, but you have to use it for the course. The second thing we're using is Discord and uh, Discord is not mandated by NTNU. So if you don't want to use it, you technically don't have to. But I encourage you to sign up if you don't use it yet and be on the channels because then you can interact with the teaching assistants. You can ask questions and you can um, get notifications of what is happening. So what uh, other students are asking and what is happening in the class. So I understand that some of you may be against sort of social networking and don't want to have Discord, but it, it kind of is really hard if you don't. Uh, but you technically don't have to, right? But with GitLab, you have to. Um, with um, blog, Blackboard, um, we are all on Blackboard and we technically could use Blackboard, but the moment you leave university, you will never see Blackboard ever again, right? And it's a little bit useless for us to be spending a lot of time and learning how to do things in Blackboard. If we can spend more time and learn how to do things in GitLab or other kind of a version control system, which you're gonna use every day in your life, in your professional life, right? So I actually prefer us using GitLab instead of Blackboard. Uh, so that's why we have almost all activities and announcements and everything done through GitLab. Uh, that's the rationale for it. All right, so any questions so far? If no questions, I will go very quickly through a, um, a kind of a course, um, rules so we have some um some agreements yeah You're supposed to see it yeah you su you're supposed to see it <laughs> thanks very good point <laughs> great so the online people saw it but you didn't see it physically so um there is a file called course rules and you can check it and it basically says um, that you don't have to come to classes if you don't want to, you can leave at any time. Um, I might be a bit late, like I was late starting the recording today, which I really apologize. Um, and that we are kind of following certain expectations about the course, right? Uh, so the, I don't want to go through all of it, uh, you can read it at your time, but the interesting one is that we're making kind of a, some small changes in the course and we're saying you should use ChatGPT and you should use Copilot, okay? Uh, but there is a caveat to that, okay? The caveat is that at the end of the course, you will have an exam and you will have to sit at school in front of Inspera exam and you have to do coding and there'll be no ChatGPT and no Copilot. You'll have to code from your head only, right? That's the exam. So you should use ChatGPT and Copilot to learn how to code, but you have to know how to code yourself. Um, okay, so you can do some tasks and you can do uh, the sort of assignments that we have in the course using the Copilot or ChatGPT, and that's fine. Um, but if you just do it, then you will not learn how, you know, how it works and how you can do it yourself. Uh, and you have to, because at the end of the course, you will be tested of what you know, right? 
Um, so we will, during the course, we will sort of see how can we benefit from Copilot and ChatGPT? How can we solve things? But at the same time, we will learn how to do it ourselves. Um, so I, I was thinking of an analogy, how, how it sort of works now. Uh, so the analogy is that I always wanted to be a pilot and I can sit in a flight simulator and I can kind of fly with the autopilot. But if I ask you, would you like to fly with me in a real plane? You would probably say no, <laughs> because you never flew a real plane, Marius, right? You kind of uh, know the autopilot and you know like the bit of a simulated theory, but I wouldn't trust my life flying with you in a real plane, right? It's the same with programming. So if all you do is like using chat GPT and copilot for programming, then I wouldn't trust you to program something for me because um, you know you don't know what you're doing really, right? It's like me trusting the, um, the system instead of you. Uh, and if I tell you to do something, like if you're doing some medical application, I actually trust that you will do it in a certain level of accuracy and um, you know proficiency such that I can sort of have this trust relationship, right? Uh, you will notice that ChatGPT is great. It's a very useful tool for solving a lot of small things, but it makes a lot of mistakes. And sometimes it lies to you, right? Uh, and ability to recognize when it's lying and when it's making mistakes is what we are trying to learn, right? We're not trying to learn that we type everything ourselves. That's kind of useless in modern times. That's why we use IDEs and that's why we use the tools. But the ability to understand what is happening and the ability to specify what we really want is what we need to learn. And that we have to learn, you know, by other means, by books, by understanding and by doing things ourselves. So please read the, the rules. Uh, they are kind of very simple. Um, so the in, in important one that it's okay to use internet, it's okay to use Stack Overflow and so on. And it's, you know, encouraged to use ChatGPT, um, but the exam is without it. So, you know, you have to learn enough to pass the exam without using those tools and without having the IDE. So if you always rely on code completion and you don't remember the function names, well, tough luck, you know, you'll have some hard time in the exam because the exam will ask you to do something and it's like, yeah, there was this function, but I don't remember what is it called, right? You sort of need to memorize some small things. You don't need to memorize everything, but you need to memorize some things. Um, and then the other important thing there is that we don't have group work in this course. Uh, so everything is individual. Uh, some students uh, will like it, some students may not like it, but in general, the consensus was you have other courses where you have a lot of group work and a lot of students kind of like to be individual uh, and they want to express their sort of uh, self-work. And this course is for those students. So uh, every, everything is kind of individual here. All right, any questions? I speak so fast. Should I speak slower? Yes. <laughs> all right. It's all simple. So there was no kind of difficult concept so far, right? So we can be a bit faster. All right. So we have uh, a little bit more time. So um, please open your computers or, or telephones and let's do a little bit of a Mentimeter. Uh, so you will answer some questions about what you already know. Um, and in general, please bring your laptops uh, and um, bring your phones or something for the sessions. So even for the lectures, if you have your computer, that will be helpful. We often try things out uh, and we often have a Mentimeter. So then we, yeah, we kind of want to make it interactive if, if possible. So I think is the number visible for everybody? I guess so. Yeah. Um, can you do the course remotely? Yes, you can, but it's a bit harder. It's it's better if you come and kind of do things here. Um, and we often record lectures, but we don't record everything. And when we have discussions and we're doing some tasks, we will be. I will be explaining things and th that's not recorded because it's part of the sort of uh, lab sessions, right? So they will, it, it is possible like for Benjamin to be remote. Uh, he has to be remote because 
he, he, he has certain circumstances. But for those of you who are in Jovig and you can come, I encourage you to come on Fridays and, and participate. Um, all right. So let's try if this works. Uh, you should be able to type programming languages that you consider that you know already. So give me some of the programming languages that you know. So C++ and Python are dominating the statistics. Um, there is some research which suggests that you are very biased by the programming language that you learned first, that your way of thinking and your way of solving problems is kind of biased by the very first language you've learned, right? Um, so it is kind of, we don't, we don't think about it, uh, that it's so important, but it is kind of important. Uh, I learned programming from um, assembly. <laughs> so my first programming language was assembly. So it's a very tedious linear kind of process of moving memory around. Uh, and then I learned basic. And basic was like, whoa, things are so easy now. Like you have uh, jumps, you can kind of, uh, I mean, in assembly also have jumps, but you can kind of uh, have uh, more structured, um, structured things. And then I learned Pascal, which is sort of like a, similar to C, you could say, but but a little bit higher le level, like you don't have pointers that, I, I mean, you do have pointers, but yeah, it's a kind of like a similar to C where you have functions and you have, um, uh, you can uh, return from functions and so on. And it was really hard for me to, um, to learn some of the concepts, uh, like for example, for loop, like it's obvious, like what for loop is doing, but if you only, if, if my first language was um, jumps and you kind of do conditional jumps, uh, you don't have a concept of a loop, right? The, you're always doing loop yourself manually. So then understand like that the loop is what you used to do by hand was actually quite hard. It took me like a few days to understand what for loop is doing. <laughs> and it's trivial, right? Like you, you think, oh, come on, Marius, like for loop is the most trivial thing ever, right? Um, but it's, it is like demonstrates the bias, right? So if you learn something doing certain way, and if there is much better way to do it differently, you will have hard time understanding this, this new way, right? And it's a little bit like that in Haskell. So in Haskell, those people who come from uh, C++, there is a lot of better ways of doing some things, but they insist that, you know, a C++ way of doing it is the only best way because it's kind of hard to kind of turn your head around and understand what is really going on, right? Um, all right, so uh, no real surprises here. We have um, C++ and Python dominating. C++ because of the history of the degree probably, and Python because it's so useful. Uh, a lot of people use it for a lot of things and it's very easy to learn. Um, all right, so then let's see. Um, do you need to answer for this one? No. So uh, typically, that's the you know go to um, first thing to try in any programming language that you do. Uh, so the question is, um, in which of those languages can you write a uh, you know hello world program? So it has to be a program which basically prints hello world to the terminal screen. So in which languages can you do it? So in JavaScript and Python, it's, it's very easy. Uh, in some other languages, like especially in Java, it is easy as well, but it's a kind of, uh, you have to type a lot of more stuff, right? Um, you have to have a class and then you have to have a static main function and so on. So it's a lot of typing similar, uh, similar, but not as bad in C++ and in C. All right. 
Sounds good? I will show you uh, next time uh, comparisons for the last three years once I collect all the statistics from this. So uh, dining philosophers. So so here, you know, you, you, you told me that you can do hello world in all those languages, right? Um, dining philosophers, how many of you know what that problem is? Who know who knows that problem? Okay, so not everybody knows it. So in uh, programming, we often use dining philosophers as a kind of a metaphor for a resource constrained environment where you have multiple processes or multiple threads and they need access to some limited resources to, to achieve the task, right? So in this case, we have um, uh, five philosophers and we have um, one, two, three, five philosophers and we have uh, five forks, but to eat it's a spaghetti or whatever dish it is, the rule is that to eat that dish, you need two forks, right? And the setup is like a round table and you have uh, five people trying to eat, but only how many people at the time can eat if you need two forks to eat? Mm -hmm. Only two people at the time can eat, right? So you have five people around the table, five plates, but only two people at the time can eat because they can grab the two forks, right? And then there will be one fork free, right? So one person can grab that one fork, but cannot grab the, the second fork, right? So let's say um, let's say this here uh, is the non-eating person, and then this one will will is eating, so is occupying those two forks, and this one is eating, occupying those two forks. So if this person grabs this fork, even if this fork becomes available because this person kind of stops, this person will not be able to grab that left fork because even though this person is not eating, that person grabbed already the fork, right? You you get the idea? So we have a problem, like we have a problem and we have kind of a starvation problem, right? So what, some of the people who are supposed to eat may not ever eat, right? Because they will never get two forks at the time. So we are trying to sub set up a system in such a way that we will not have um, that we will not have the starvation. So that's one problem. The second problem is if this person, um, if this per let's say this person uh, 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 here grabs this fork because um, those two forks are used and those two forks are used. Now this person is not eating and this person is not eating. But if this fork becomes available. Uh, and this person is not eating because this person fork is not free, then this person cannot eat, even though it could, if, if that was not uh, locked, right? And if you kind of extrapolate it around, you may get a situation where nobody is eating because everybody just has one fork. They kind of are grabbed one fork. So if we have the situation say, okay, go, and then everybody is right-handed and grabs the right fork first, then nobody can eat because nobody can grab the left fork, right? So that's called deadlock. And then nobody can eat, right? So we have two problems. We have deadlock and starvation. So what we do in programming, we often simulate that we have five uh, resources and five um, plates. And then the processes need to obtain a lock on two of those resources to do something and then release it. And we observe the properties, right? So we code a simple application which has five threads in this case, and five resources, and you, you try to simulate what is going on. Is it is your implementation leading to deadlock? Is your implementation leading to starvation? Or is your implementation kind of uh, distributing the load such that it actually solves the problem and everybody eats and the plates get cleaned, right? So who can code this problem in of the, any of those languages? Typically we do this, we, we do this kind of a dining philosophers when we're learning about multi-threading and when we learn about threads. Um, yes, so you should, uh, you, you took already the operating system scores, right? Yeah, and did you have that problem there? Did you? You just uh, mentioned it. Okay. It's but you didn't have to do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So it's a little bit more involved problem. 
and some languages are less, um, let's say, uh, easy to express that problem in, right? So for example, languages like uh, JavaScript and Python, which tend to be typically single-threaded, are uh, kind of a cumbersome to express that problem in them because you don't natively have a lot of support for multi-threading, right? Languages which are by nature multi-threaded, like uh, with PT threads in C or C++, Golang or Java, it's kind of easier to express uh, this problem in, right? But you can see the, uh, the situation is much different now um, in terms of the coverage and also in terms of skills. All right, so what is the best language to express the dining philosopher's problem in? Like if you knew all the programming languages uh, and you um, have, you can, could pick what would be your choice. Yeah, so in, in general, the languages that have kind of a, a, a good distributed processing kind of um, support in. So Golang is very good for it, uh, but even better is Erlang. So Erlang has a very nice uh, support for uh, concurrency uh, because it was designed to be natively concurrent for supporting um, uh, telecommunication systems where you have a lot of switches, a lot of exchanges, and it has to do a lot of concurrent processing in real time. So by design, it has a very strong and very nice support for actors and then doing things kind of in, in parallel. Um, but Go, Go is, is very good too. So my, my choice would be um, Erlang or, or Golang. So Erlang, because it primarily was designed for concurrency. Like it was designed to do the dining philosopher's problem kind of the, the best, right? Okay, so what do you use in your day-to-day -day work as a programmer the most? Yeah, so, so some of you uh, did that course before. <laughs> and uh, the, the whole point here is that, yeah, you're using your head, right? So yes, you, you use tools. You use tools like a keyboard or a screen or a language, but you're solving problems with your head. Um, so that's the primary kind of thing that you use the most. Uh, the tools, how you solve it, sometimes you're solving it with pen and paper. I brought some today. Uh, sometimes you're using a keyboard. Uh, sometimes you're using a drawing board. Sometimes you're using a specific language. Uh, but all of those are tools, but the tool that you use every single time is your head, right? Um, that's the main point. And that's the main point of this course as well. All right, so then we have some questions for um, more competitive answers. So participate, it's anonymous, no penalties, it's all good, safe. All right, is everyone in? I think most people are in. That one is easy. So programming versus coding. Um, those two terms are often used interchangeably. Think if they are the same. Oops, there was no quiz. You have, did you have the question? No. Um, yeah, I have to do this. Sorry. So are those two words synonymous? Yeah, quick. Or oh, something is broken. Did everybody vote it? 
So they are not synonymous. So the answer is false. So they are often used interchangeably. Uh, a lot of people say uh, programming or coding. Uh, they mean one or the other, but sometimes they use it wrong. Um, so what is the um, what is programming? Yeah, it's kind of nice here uh, because someone says, um, oh, where is it? Yeah, chat GPT here. So pro pro programming would be telling chat GPT what code you need, right? That would be programming. And then ChatGPT speed kind of giving you the code would be coding, right? So programming is all about thinking on how to solve something, like what and how you need something to be solved. Um, so it's like finding a solution in your head for a problem and also finding a way how to solve it. And then coding, is expressing that solution in a certain way of a textual representation. Um, so those are two different things. And in a lot of companies, those two tasks are separated. So the programming is often done by senior people and then coding is often done by juniors or somebody who is kind of uh, less responsible, right? So you tell the juniors what do you need and how they should do it, and they just code it, right? Uh, but the way you design the solution and the way you design the problem or how it should be solved is what you do when you are doing programming. Uh, and this course is about programming. Uh, of course, we have to do coding uh, because we want to try out if our solutions actually work uh, and we don't have the juniors. So we have to do it ourselves. But you have ChatGPT and you have Copilot. So you kind of have some juniors to help you, right? Uh, so ChatGPT and Copilot are sort of de facto juniors for us, uh, but the kind of programming is done by us. Um, if the juniors do something wrong, you tell them, no, 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 no. I wanted a linked list or I wanted an array of fixed size. You don't do it by recursion. Do it like the way I want it to, do, to be done, right? And then they will have to rewrite it. Uh, but the solution is kind of given by, by us. Excellent. Um, so I already, yeah, I already told you what coding is, uh, but you can kind of try. <laughs> uh, no. Yes. 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 Um, so one one thing in this course, uh, it's a little bit. Um, important for us to be precise, uh, to use a kind of a proper word for something that what we mean, right? Uh, a lot of people, a lot of time people say AI, okay? And I don't know what they mean, right? Uh, what, what do you mean? <laughs> do you mean uh, large language models like ChatGPT or what exactly do you mean, right? It's important for us when we talk with colleagues and when we talk in this course to try to be precise of what we mean, right? Uh, so with coding and programming, yes, we do it interchangeably. Uh, it's not such a big sin if you say, oh, I was programming, uh, you know, because we often do both, right? So we often solve a problem by coding it and then thinking about it and coding it again. And you have a cycle of like thinking and kind of coding and thinking and coding, and you cannot separate it. You cannot say I've done programming here and I've done coding here, right? Th th those two activities are kind of... Um, done at the same time, like together, you're kind of doing both, right? But, and then you say, I was programming, right? But you were programming and coding, right? <clears throat> okay, so how well are you in C11?
that's what you used, right? You've used in your first semester, um, the C11 standard, right? Yeah. So it is 11 o'clock, but I will kind of, um, I will finish this and then we'll have a break and then we'll do a little bit something else. So let's let's spend a few more minutes um, just going through the through this um, Mentimeter and then we'll have a break after. All right. So many of you said, yeah, you are kind of um, advanced or medium in C11. So what C11 introduced to the C language? Not so great, right? <laughs> yes, it is partially correct, this answer, and this answer is partially correct. So if we count all those three, yeah, it's probably the same as the previous answer, right? So it's not too bad. But to be precise, it introduced both, right? So you kind of need to be precise, and especially in multi-choice questions. If you if, if that was a multi-choice question kind of answer, you know, pe people who answer this or this wouldn't score a point. Only people here would score points, right? So precision is important. All right. Um, what <laughs> bugs? Ah, I see, we have a leaderboard. So we have some people who dominate uh, really fast and accurate, and the rest is quite uniformly distributed. Very good. So what programming paradigms do you know? So programming languages is one thing, and then programming paradigms is another thing. Most programming languages these days are so-called multi-paradigm. So you can use different paradigms with that same language. Historically, uh, when I was a student, uh, we had one language per paradigm. So the language was kind of uh, very tied to the paradigm and it was very embedded you know, in that specific paradigm. But these days, most languages you can kind of mix. Uh, they sort of mix the paradigms. Uh, so we have object oriented, yes. We have functional, procedural. Um, yep. Uh, declarative. Uh, when I was a student, again, declarative languages were the thing people were saying, our teachers were saying, yeah, that's the next big thing. You know, everybody will be using declarative languages in 10 years' time, right? Uh, have you heard about declarative languages? <laughs> No, so they were wrong, right? Whatever my teachers told me was wrong. Whatever I'm telling you, probably in 10 years is gonna be wrong as well, right? Uh, so I'm trying to um, to kind of prepare you for unpredictable future. Um, so declarative languages didn't become the next big thing and so on. What What is the, the saying now? You know, AI is gonna be the next big thing, right? Programming will kind of stop existing because everything will be programmed by chat GPT, right? Uh, I don't think so. So, and I'm not telling you that. Um, all right. So, imperative. Um, I don't know what programming paradigms are. Good question. So, what are programming paradigms? I don't have a slide for it, but like if someone has an idea, you can say. Yep. Sort of a style of programming and how, how you ought to decode. For instance, in class uh, object oriented programming, you have classes. Yes. Well, in functional, you don't really have that. Exactly. So a, a paradigm is basically the same as in a kind of a scientific paradigm, so kind of a thinking paradigms. It's a it's a set of constructs that you use to express your kind of concepts or or things, right? So in functional programming, you have a concept of a function. And that's a, a very fundamental thing, and you use it kind of everywhere. 
So you pass functions to functions, you return functions from functions, you keep state in functions, you have carries and, and so on and so forth. Like you use functions for everything and everywhere, right? In object-oriented, you say, yeah, but in object-oriented, I also have functions. Yeah, but you cannot really do the same level of like, um, you know, moving functions around. You kind of can, but it's cumbersome in C++, right? So, but we have classes. So then you say, I have an instance and I have a class type and I have polymorphic functions. So you have a certain concepts that you use to express solutions for your problems. You don't have that in functional, right? Um, declarative, you are more declaring what you want and the runtime system kind of does it for you. So you're not telling the runtime system, do this, do this, do this. You're saying, I want this to be done with this kind of uh, constraints and just do it for me, kind of solve it, right? Um, in imperative, we tell it, do this, do this, do this, do this, right? Uh, so there are different kind of um, um, metaphors and different constructs of what, what we use. And that's what this course is about, to kind of uh, expand your vocabulary. So um, many people kind of um, heard of object-oriented and functional, but what it really means, right? What is really the difference? Uh, both have functions. So what is the difference? Uh, imperative. Um, okay. Uh, what is the difference here and here? Um, well, in normal imperative programming, for example, you cannot declare an infinite list. Can you declare an infinite list in C++? Can you say, I have a list from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to infinity? No, you cannot, right? Can you do it in Rust? Yes, you can. Can you do it in Haskell? Yes, you can. You can have infinite lists. It's like, whoa, how is that possible? For imperative programmers, that's impossible. Like you cannot have infinite lists, right? Uh, but in a declarative languages or declarative kind of paradigms, why not? So if I have a list which says I have a list from zero to infinity, zero, one, two, three, and have an, another list which says one, two, three to infinity, I can add them together. Wow, you know? Um, so that's kind of cool, right? You will kind of learn what those terms mean and how you can use them and what languages kind of give you what, right? So we use a lot of terminology in, um, uh, in, uh, in programming. We use scripting versus programming. We will statically ver type versus dynamically typed. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go for a little bit longer than I thought. So let's have a break. And then let's talk about it um, after a break. So let's let's have a 10-minute break. And let's reconvene at 17 past 11. Ten minutes. All right. Hey. Just two questions. Yeah. Um, is there like a certain amount of book we should read, the whole book, or should we read the entire thing? Should read the entire thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like not immediately, right? We're gonna take some time. Yeah. So we're gonna read the first, I think, four or five chapters in the first half of the course. And then the rest, right? Okay. So you have the whole semester to read the book. Yeah. And the, the goal in lectures, yeah. will they be no, like, will you announce which lectures will be going before the lectures? I will because some people from other uh, degrees who are doing cloud, they sometimes come for those. Yeah. So I coordinate with Christopher and I will say, I will have a Golang session and then he will invite the other students to come as well. Yeah. 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 So I will do that. Yeah. Will um <laughs> like the first lab will that be announced today or will that be next week? Like actual work for us to yeah. So uh we don't have a slot today, mm -hmm. but I will be available and I will check with Arnold and Alexander if we can be here mm -hmm. and then help you to install Golang uh, uh yeah. install Haskell yeah. and Rust. Uh, and we will kind of not really do kind of a task today, but yeah. I will announce it uh, for next week and we will, we will kind of work on it next Friday. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I will try to announce kind of the task per week on Mondays yeah. and then you can kind of look at it. And then on Fridays, will it will be the time when we kind of work on it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
the phone ring if we're, if we're going to have a meeting. Well, let's have a sit down with you discuss some of the stories. Uh, so are you available after two o'clock today? Yeah, I think so. So let's let's meet at two uh, in my office. And uh, we will have a short meeting and then we'll come. I will check what room is available and we will kind of uh, meet with students afterwards. Um, because I would like those who want to have uh, Haskell and Rust installed today. And that's the only thing we will do in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. So if you're available, then we can do it. If not, then we can uh, meet after this class. Uh, we will meet before the lab. Yeah. At two. Cloud is from two uh, from uh, twelve to two. Yeah. So after after, after two. Yeah. That's, that's, that's... Yeah. Okay. Because you're helping with cloud as well. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> so you'll have to do a bit of a go lang yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, very strong. Yeah. That's very strong. Uh, A two one three. Uh, yeah. And I will check what room I can book. Yes, yeah, yeah.
Okay, let's uh, let's continue. Uh, as I announced, we don't have a slot today, but th for those of you who want to um, meet with the teaching assistants and me and uh, install uh, Haskell and Rust uh, and get a bit of a just initial sort of lab, uh, we will meet at four uh, at two fifteen and two five five, which is just next next door, uh, and it's only just for installation, right? Uh, there is no real task. What we will do is we will work in a kind of a um, task-based mode where I will release uh, a task over the weekend or on Monday, and then we will talk about it and kind of uh, do it in the lab, which is on Friday. Um, and I will have kind of, I will try to have tasks every, every week. Um, do you have to do all of the tasks? Of course not. Uh, so the, 
uh, the assessment in the course is based on the portfolio and then on the exam. The exam is um, in Spera multi-choice exam with some programming and some uh, writing like uh, answers, like short answers. Uh, it is at the end of the course, of course, uh, and there is no aid. So as I said, you will need to answer questions about the terminology and about some concepts that we learned throughout the course. Plus you will have to demonstrate that you can solve some programming problems yourself. Um, what is portfolio? So portfolio is a little bit of a weird concept if you haven't ever done a portfolio, but the idea is that it is kind of a collection of all the work that you've done. So for example, when you are a design student and you're graduating, you have a portfolio of different art uh, concepts or art pieces that you've done throughout. If you are like a 3D modeler, your portfolio is all the 3D characters that you've done, you know, in, in a course or in the course of your degree. Uh, if you are architect, then your portfolio is all the architectural buildings that you've designed over the period of time, right? What is a portfolio for us? For us, it's the number of programs or tasks or kind of a puzzles that we solved plus additional contributions. So I had a bit of a list. Um, I have a list at the wiki, which uh, says what the portfolio consists of. So it's kind of a, it consists of code that you've done with, of course, with the help of chat GPT or whatever you've used. Uh, it's the code for, yeah, so there is a distinction between um, the labs and assignments. I will clarify that. Um, there is a contribution to peer review because we will have some uh, assignments which will, we'll have some tasks which are uh, done on this weekly basis and we'll have some assignments that you have submit and other people will have to comment on them, right? Uh, so th there is a kind of a, a, a two types. Uh, I will explain where we'll, where we'll need to have that, but about portfolio. So it's all of that. Plus, if you are contributing the peer review, that's part of the portfolio. Uh, any bug fixes or merge requests that you do for the code in the course uh, or for the examples, that's part of the portfolio. Any current contributions that you do in the uh, outside of the course, like if you are, uh, participate in some uh, open source projects or if you want to help with some of the code that we have, for example, for the, um, for the submission system, you can kind of up submit the patch and that's part of your portfolio, right? So any anything of that is um, your portfolio, right? Uh, including uh, answers to questions that you've helped other students in the, uh, in the GitLab. Um, so anything that you do in this course is part of the portfolio. And what you do at the end, you um, prepare a report saying, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And here is a video of demonstrating some of the examples that I've done, and then you submit it uh, in, in Spera at the end of the course. So there is no grading or anything throughout the semester, both portfolio and the exam are kind of graded at the end. Uh, and you only have a kind of, um, you know, letter grades for it, like at the end of the, of the semester, right? Um, so the portfolio is kind of anything that you're doing. So if you, answering questions, it will be kind of kept in the issue tracker. If you're doing some things on Stack Overflow or if you're doing anything with the tasks, it will be kept in the GitLab, in the kind of repositories. So then at the end of the semester, you say, yeah, I've done those tasks. This is the URLs for my code. I've answered those questions in the issue tracker. Those are the issues that I contributed discussions for. And then for the bigger things, I, you can um, say, this is the repository of the code I've done and you kind of package it up into a single document. And then this document is being reviewed by the examiner and they say, yeah, your portfolio is worth you know, that much, right? Um, so there is nothing really that you have to do or you cannot, yeah, like uh, don't have to do. It's kind of like up to you. As I said, we will probably have about 10 or 12 tasks. Uh, you don't have to do all of them but for like 50% on average, you kind of need to do 50%, right? Some are much harder than others. So in fact, um, the easier ones, it's kind of uh, worth a little bit less, but kind of on average, you can sort of consider that kind of guideline. Um, and at the end, you, you do a report and a video about your portfolio. 
uh, and the reviewer kind of watches the video and then reads the report and checks the URLs that you have in the in the report. Okay, uh, it can be a little bit vague. Uh, and we can clarify it as we are kind of are progressing. So as I introduce the initial tasks, you will kind of get the idea, okay? Um, we will have two obligatory tasks uh, and the two obligatory tasks, they are kind of a pass fail. Uh, and then those are the ones which allow you to submit the portfolio and take a, an exam. If you don't do the obligatory tasks, you have to repeat the course. And they are basically checking whether you have the fundamental basic understanding of the books that are that we are reading. So the uh, Haskell book and the uh, Rust book. So there are some small um, um, kind of a questions the I or TAs will ask you about like recursion or like a functional um, pattern matching or some things that like are very fundamental. And then if you do that, then it, you are ticked that you've done it and then it, it's fine, right? So again, I will kind of explain it a little bit later when I will introduce the obliques and I will tell you what exactly is expected for the oblique to pass. Um, so the first oblique will be probably in uh, the end of February or beginning of March. And then the next one will be towards the end of the course, um, roughly speaking, but they are not, not hard to pass. Um, any questions about that? If not, we go back to more fun things, which are the terminology. So um, scripting languages and programming languages. It's a little bit controversial topic, right? I will not kind of go there, but statically typed versus dynamically typed is a very uh, precise topic. So what uh, statically typed languages do you know? C, perfect. What dynamically typed languages do you know? Python. Python, perfect. All right, so you know the difference, right? What's the difference? What is the difference between statically typed language and dynamically typed language? Yeah? In statically typed languages, you care what kind of uh, uh, variable types you use. Yeah. Or in dynamically typed, they will be automatically determined. Almost correct. So if I say auto, like I have a variable i, and I say auto in C++, would that mean that it's the dynamically typed? Okay. Not really, because, yeah? If the dynamically typed also converts the types? Yeah, so the, the difference is like your definition was almost perfect, but it is done at kind of a compile time. Uh, or at the runtime. And for the statically typed languages, it is done once and it stays there forever. So if I say something is of that type, it will always forever be that type. Um, if I say in dynamically typed languages, I have variable i, it can be a string or it can, I, later I can make it a number and the you know, language says, yeah, it's fine. Now it's a number uh, or previously was a string, that's fine. In C++, it doesn't work like that. In C++, if you have a variable i, it has a well-defined type, but often you don't have to say it. If you say auto, the compiler will infer what the type is, right? So um, it doesn't mean in statically typed languages that you have to tell it it's an int. Uh, you can say it's an auto, right? Uh, and the type will be derived by the compiler, but it will be derived at the compile time and it st stays. I is whatever the compiler think it is, right? So sometimes, the compiler will think it's an int, but you say, no, 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 it should be a float. And then you say, it's a float, right? But sometimes you, out of convenience, you don't want to type this long, um, you know, types. And you say, you know, you, you, you often say, it's an auto V equals, and then you have some function calls and you don't want to specify what V type is because it's like a long complex type in C++, right? So you say auto, right? But it doesn't mean this is a dynamic type. No, no, no. It has a well-defined type. It's just that you don't type it here. You let the compiler to tell you what the type is, right? Yeah. So very good. Um, so with and without type inference. So that is similar to what we just discussed, right? Language that doesn't have type inference will force you to say here what it is. It will force you to say, ah, it is an int, right? 
or it is a float, right? So a language without type inference will force you to like statically type to, to declare what that V is. The language with type inference allow you to say out of, I mean, uh, please infer for me what the type is, right? So C++ obviously is a language with type inference. Um, and um, can you do that in C? Can you have a variable whose type is inferred by the compiler? Or do you have to tell it what it is? You generally have to tell, yes. So the C is an example of a language without type inference. So you basically tell it yourself what you want the variables to be, right? Of course, you have pointers, and pointers are kind of uh, opaque because they have you, you can point to something of different type, right? But that's a different story. Okay, declarative versus imperative. We talked a little bit about it already. So like, for example, infinite list is a good example of a declarative data structure versus an imperative data structure, which cannot deal with infinities, right? Um, this is also important for some uh, pattern matching or for some kind of a constraint programming. Uh, there are certain programs or problems, let's say, like for example, Sudoku, right? If you are... Um, uh, trying to write a pro program that will solve Sudoku for you. Uh, in languages like the ones we kind of using here, uh, including Rust and Haskell, uh, you have to um, declare what the data structures are, what the domains is, the do domain of those uh, types are, and then say how to search all the permutations or all the combinations, right? But there are some languages like um, uh, OZ, um, where you have, you can specify the constraints and the search is part of the language. So you don't have to tell how to search all the permutations. You say variable V is a permutation of a particular domain and it will search what that could be to fulfill the requirements for you, right? Uh, it's called constraint-based programming and it's kind of powerful for solving some, um, you know, um, some types of problems. So declarative versus imperative is um, kind of a, a larger space uh, to discuss. And we, for now, you have been exposed mostly to imperative, right? Um, so this course will kind of introduce you to some declarative things, uh, how you can solve problems by kind of declaring things instead of telling what exactly to do um, and dealing with like infinities or lazy data structures. Um, Okay, this one is also a little bit controversial. Uh, compiled versus interpreted versus bytecode. Um, so ultimately, the code has to go all the way down to the machine code which runs on a particular CPU, right? But even that concept is very blurred now because I have a M1 chip and my M1 chip is with the ARM architecture and I may have x86 machine code executed via the uh, virtualization layer on my ARM chip, right? Um, so my program from source code is compiled to machine code, um, which runs on ARM, which actually runs on, um, which runs on x86, which actually runs on ARM because I have this virtualization layer, right? But ultimately at the end of the day, it runs on my M1 chip, right? Somehow the tower of compilation and bytecode or kind of conversions ends up with a machine code, which is for my particular architecture, right? Um, so the kind of um, terminology of compiling something from one representation to another, uh, and then down to the machine code gets kind of really complicated these days. Um, but in, in, in general, we have kind of um, two broad classes of languages, one which converts the source code to the machine code, and one which converts the source code to the intermediate representation, which then gets com compiled to the machine code, right? So for example, Python is an example, or Java is an example of, you have a source code, it gets compiled to intermediate representation, and then that gets compiled 
usually pass just in time compiler into the machine code. In terms of Rust or C++, you have a source code which gets compiled to the machine code, right? You do have, you can claim some form of intermediate representation in the process, but usually the, the, the step we consider like you take a C++ source code and you end up with a binary, right? Um, so that's, some languages are kind of designed to be like this, and some languages are designed to have this intermediate format, right? So Golang is designed to be compiled language. Uh, Java is not. Java is designed to be compiled into the bytecode. And some languages are designed to be interpreted. So they are not compiled to machine code ever. They is an interpreter which interprets what the instructions are supposed to do and does it, right? And kind of executes it. Python used to be like this. Python used to be in a mode where it kind of interprets what you want to achieve, but they've built this kind of intermediary layer with just in time compiler to speed it up. Um, so this is kind of a complicated space. Um, uh, some languages have a very rich standard library and some languages have very limited standard library, right? So uh, for example, C++ tends to be on the um, small, standard library uh, site. Uh, you often need additional libraries to do things. Rust is even worse. Uh, Rust uh, library, the standard library is very small. You have to do uh, everything through external packages. Um, Haskell is uh, kind of, I would say it has a very rich standard library, uh, but you do also use external packages. Uh, Golang is an example of a language which was designed to have minimum amount of dependencies. You can almost always do everything you need in Golang without asking for additional libraries. Why, why do you think that is the case? Why do you think Google, who designed Golang, try to make a language that doesn't have any external dependencies? Security. Exactly. Security and maintainability, right? Uh, it's so much easier to maintain your code base if you don't have to check what has changed somewhere outside of your organization or somewhere else, right? Uh, a nightmare language with the opposite to Golang is Node.js. <laughs> you depend on a lot of external dependencies and you always get kind of maintenance and security nightmare situations because of that, right? So if you compare Node.js, which is kind of in the same niche as Golang, they have a completely opposite properties, right? Um, and Golang is much better in terms of security and maintainability. Okay, lazy languages, uh, it relates a little bit to declarativeness. In lazy languages, we tell the computer what to do, but it doesn't do anything. It just waits for us to, to say what we need. So if I have this infinite collection uh, from zero to, um, to infinity, it says, yeah, okay, you have infinite collection, but what do you want to do with it? Then I have to tell it, yeah, give me the first thousand numbers. Then it will actually compute that collection and gives, give me the first thousand numbers, right? Um, but if I don't tell it to print it on the screen, it will just do nothing. Um, so lazy language is kind of wait with evaluating things, with evaluating expressions until they are needed. And then uh, imperative languages or non-lazy languages, they kind of do it, uh, you know, um, at once. You you observe this in JavaScript, for example, when you're using uh, some um, frameworks where you are waiting for some response, right? So async asynchronous uh, evaluations, it's a form of laziness where you say, yeah, uh, when it comes, you will get the result, but in the meantime, you can do something else. So async is a little bit related to this. Um, Okay, with and without memory safety, that, what does that mean? So would you consider C or C++ a language with, mem let, let's say C, with memory safety? No, uh, C++? Yes, so C++ is both. If you use the row pointers, it doesn't have any memory guarantees for you, but if you use smart pointers, it will kind of um, keep your program memory safe because it will keep track of what needs to be disposed and it will kind of uh, prevent you doing some um, kind of um, bad things, right? Uh, Golang is a typical language with garbage collector and it's an example of a memory safe language where you cannot really have memory errors uh, unless you are very creative. 
uh, similar with Java or similar with Haskell. So all, all those languages are kind of, they have um, memory safety built in via kind of a runtime system. A unique language, which also has memory safety is Rust because it doesn't have a runtime system uh, or at least the runtime system is very small uh, and it kind of compiles the memory safety for you, right? So it, it is kind of a compiled language with very small um, uh, runtime system, but it has memory safety built in into the design of the language. And you will learn about it because it, it is kind of unique uh, in a sense that all this memory safety has to be expressed in the source code. <laughs> and it kind of is tedious, like the compiler will kind of uh, complain about you trying to do something that is kind of memory unsafe and it will force you to write code, which is memory safe, right? And that, that we talked about, like uh, some languages have garbage collector, some don't. Uh, languages with garbage collector typically are memory safe and typically manage memory for you. Um, okay. So, um, more terminology. Oops. So, Encapsulation, you know it from object orientation, right? Do you remember what an encapsulation is? Yep. Isolating a concept or a thing to do. Uh, so the code is a little more modular than in symbol. Correct. <laughs> Types. So, so uh, sorry, and encapsulation tries to sort of um, uh, create a layer of isolation between something and the rest, right? So when we have um, private fields in a class, we say those attributes, those things are kind of encapsulated in the type and they are not visible outside. If we have uh, like a local variables in a function, uh, those variables are also only visible in that scope. So encapsulation is kind of a generic concept about isolating some concepts or some state from outside outside work, uh, outside world. Type, uh, type is a complex. We 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 will spend um, most of this semester actually discussing this. Um, object versus instance, kind of a complex as well. Uh, some languages use uh, the term instance. Some languages use the cons the, the term object. So in object oriented, like in C++, we often say, I have an object and I have a class, right? And the object is an instance of that class. <laughs> in Java, they, they also do that. And they even have a, a type called object. So they have type called object. It was like, okay, but it's not an object, it's a type. And then you have instances of objects, which are also called objects. So it's get really confusing in Java, right? Um, but the idea is that you have, um, kind of instances, you have um, um, examples of something, and then you have a type or a class, which is a domain of those instances, right? Uh, and we often use one term or the other, and it, it carries slightly different meaning. So an object usually means that we are dealing with object-oriented constructs, and we have a type which encapsulates some behavior and state. So an object usually has a certain state and certain behaviors that can happen on that, on that object, right? Um, an instance usually is considered that you don't have the behavior. You just have an example of something, uh, but you may also call an object an instance. So it gets kind of vague. Uh, so it's a little bit like those three terms. Um, Somewhat you have to be a bit, you have to explain what do you mean, right? Uh, so for example, in Golang, Golang is not an object-oriented language, right? But we have structs. Do, yeah, you didn't have Golang yet, right? No, so we come back to it later. Uh, pointers versus references. What's the difference? Again, we often use those terms interchangeably, right? But they mean two different things. They are not interchangeable. Um, 
So a pointer is a memory handle to a something that exists in memory. So a pointer points to a memory location. Um, a reference points to something else which lives in memory, but it's like you kind of say, I have a reference to a variable. Uh, you cannot say I have a pointer to a variable. You have a pointer to an int which sits in, in, in a memory, right? But the variable is kind of a, like a, 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 a different level. Um, so you're referencing something that is in kind of your language in, the, in your constructs, whereas a pointer has a more precise meaning like in C++, C and C++. It sort of uh, points to a memory location, right? Um, so you have both references and pointers in C++ and you use both depending what you want to achieve. So those two terms are not, not the same. Then we have variables. Um, so variables uh, can be mutable or immutable. Uh, in languages like C, C++, uh, you were exposed to variables which were always um, mutable. And then you had constants uh, and the constants were immutable, right? So once you declare a constant, then that means that will forever be what it is. Uh, but you also can have languages which have immutable variables. Um, what would be the difference between a variable that is immutable and a constant? Typically, yeah? Like uh, strings in Python, it feels like you can change the string to manipulate it. No. In reality, it's actually creating a new string. Yeah, for example. In C or C++, if, if you imagine that you have ability to declare a variable immutable, what would that change in the language? So um, a constant is something that has to be known typically at the compile time, right? So if I say, I have a, a constant which is pi and it's like 3.14, blah, blah, blah. Then that, that constant is known when the compiler is reading my source code. And then every, every time I'm using pi, it knows what it is, right? Um, so that's what constant is. Variable is something that is unknown to the compiler, which becomes known when the program runs. So immutable variable is something that becomes known when the program runs and immutable is, it becomes known and it cannot change. It's like uh, fixed. Whereas mutable variable can kind of a change uh, value. Literal is related to constants, but it is um, a concept that you know by, like, by design uh, from C, C++ because you use a lot of literals. Like for example, if I say, uh, if I say 10, <laughs> what, what is 10? 10 is a literal, which represents a number in decimal, which is of value 10, right? Uh, if I say, mama, that's a literal, which represents a string, right? So literal is something in the source code, which is exactly what it represents, right? So in some languages like Python, you can say, uh, I have a literal mama and I can do dot and I can do something like you, you, can, you can do some operations as if it was an object or as if it was a kind of a variable of value mama, right? Uh, in some languages, you cannot do that, but literals are kind of the, uh, the representations of what it represents literally in the source code. And languages which have rich literals are uh, very nice to work with because you can kind of uh, express them without having a variable for it or without having kind of additional kind of pointer to it, right? Um, so some languages allow you to express the entire object. Uh, JavaScript is, is an example of that. You can start curly brace. You can start typing your kind of object and you can finish with curly brace and it becomes like, yeah, it is that object, right? And then you can actually use it you can pass it around. You can say my variable is this object here, right? Uh, in some languages, you cannot do that. Like in Java, you have to say new uh, class and you have to start with the constructor and then you have to populate it with certain attributes. Um, functions versus methods. Uh, that's also um, 
a kind of a complicated uh, terminology, which is often interchanged. Uh, so typically we, we use function for things that are not associated with anything else. So a function kind of is a conversion from the input parameters to the output, but it doesn't live in a kind of a context. Whereas a method is a function which is attached to some context. Um, again, we will come back to it when you have Golang uh, and when we start with Haskell because um, and Rust because it will become kind of obvious. Um, pure functions, you should know pure functions now from C++. So what is a pure function? Yep. Function with no side effects. Exactly. Beautiful definition. It means if I have a function and I give it a certain parameter, it will always return the same value. So if I call it multiple times with the same parameter, it will always return me the same value, right? There is no side effects and that function doesn't read anything from anywhere neither, right? So it only uses what it, it takes as an input and calculates the output, right? Um, so a function which is, for example, you know, I have a int a function f which takes two integers and returns the sum, that would be a pure function, right? Uh, but if this function takes some uh, something from the context, so if I have some sort of something else uh, in a global context outside of this function, let's call it m, if this function is like this, that would not be pure because the output depends on what m is and m is kind of outside of the scope of this function, right? So m can change. Uh, if m was a constant, then that would be a pure function, right? Excellent. Uh, so side effects, what are side effects? What side effects do you know? Input output, exactly. That's the standard one. Um, so any 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 time we print something out or read something from the uh, input, then that is a side effect. Um, modifying something in the context, like if this function is almost pure, it looks pure, but it also says m equals m plus one. We have some sort of outside counter. That's a side effect, right? because n will change if I call this function thousand times n will be different than if I call it once, right? Uh, without it, it is a pure function because it doesn't affect anything outside of the function, right? So that is a side effect as well. All right, and the final one, uh, concurrency versus parallelism. What's the difference? Yeah? With concurrency, you're running things one at, set, one at a time, so after each other. On parallelism, you run at the same time simultaneously. Yeah, and what what would you like to say? Uh, I thought that concurrency is um, like two processes or threads that share memory. Mm -hmm. But for for some reason, parallelism they don't share uh, memory. Mm -hmm. I think I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. So. Um... Parallelism is a stronger claim. Basically, parallelism means two things will run at the same time. They may or may not share something. Uh, so, for example, in the GPU, when you have like you know four thousand ninety six uh, processing units and they all compute something at the same time, you we calling about parallel processing, right? Uh, but concurrency is a more abstract concept, which says certain things appear to be happening kind of uh, concurrently uh, happening um, as if they were happening at the same time. So, but you can have concurrency on a single CPU. So you have a single CPU and you are running two threads, like for example, your GUI and some disk access, but you're doing it by time partitioning. So as, as he said, right? So we, we giving a little bit of time to this process and then a little bit time to this process, a little bit to this, a little bit to this, a little bit to this, a little bit to this. And for us, it appears as if they are running together, but in fact, on the fine grain, they are kind of uh, context switched, right? Uh, they are not true parallel processes. Um, so concurrency is a more abstract concept, which says uh, we are programming something to run 
uh, concurrently, but how it actually physically runs, it depends on the architecture and often it, it is either parallel or kind of a simulated, right? So when we are doing programming, we almost, almost always talk about concurrent programming uh, because we don't care if it's uh, a threads are run on uh, individual cores on our CPU or they are simulated by the operating system. Uh, but sometimes when we're programming um, GPUs, we want the situation to be kind of a parallel. And then we run a parallel, we do kind of a parallel programming by telling which CPU should run what, right? All right. Um, so I have, uh, we have uh, five minutes left. Uh, let me see how how much I have here. I have here um, a little bit more to go through. So let's, yeah, let's finish the terminology. This one is a con con um, complex um, concept. Um, so you are familiar with classes, but after this course, you should be familiar with trades and meta classes as well. And you should be able to tell a little bit of a difference, like what are what are those three different what those three different terms mean, right? Um, inheritance, you are familiar with inheritance uh, from C plus plus. When object oriented became kind of a hot topic, like in seventies um, and eighties, um, people thought uh, the inheritance and kind of encapsulation in all terms is like the best thing that ever happened to programming. Um, but over the years, uh, we learned that those kind of a deep uh, inheritance hierarchies are actually nightmare to maintain. They are nightmare to design and they don't really work. So a lot of modern, more modern programming languages like uh, Rust or Golang, they sort of uh, go away from inheritance and they do uh, encap um, um, they do um, a kind of um, they limit your hierarchies to not be able to inherit behavior by having kind of a virtual functions, but by delegating uh, if you need a, a kind of a behavior from a behavior that is already there, you have to explicitly kind of call it. Uh, and in terms of data structure, you have kind of um, inheritance like embedding, uh, yeah. but you don't have it in the kind of a C++ way. So you will see in Golang and in Rust that they do have sort of, they can express the same things, but using slightly different constructs. So inheritance is like, we are kind of are going away a little bit from, um, from that. Uh, generics, what are generics? The data type is not known in the file time, so it can invite the functions, so you can accept multiple types. Exactly. So in C++, you do it how? Templates. Templates, perfect. Um, so generics is a way to deal with uh, abstract algorithm without specifying exactly what the type of the data structure needs to be, right? Uh, so why do we like generics or why do we want generics? Because, yeah. It makes us write much less code. Exactly. It makes us write less code. Um, so for example, if we have a list and we have a, a, an algorithm saying, I have a list which I can add something into and kind of um, uh, delete something from, um, and the, the the store for the list is some sort of a memory array of, of some sort that I'm kind of uh, keeping the data in. I kind of don't care uh, for adding and removing what the type is because I can adjust my um, data structure kind of automatically, right? So um, if, if it works for ints, it will work the same way for floats, right? Uh, so if I have this, this written for ints, I would have to repeat it exactly the same for floats, right? Because it is kind of the same behavior. Um, so to avoid this repetition, we use generics. Um, there are two mechanisms to deal with generics. One is the compiler writes the duplicated code for us. And most languages do that. So C++, because of the templates, 
the compiler checks for which types a particular template is being used, and it will actually generate the code for that type. Um, and there is uh, another mechanism which does a little bit more tricks with the type system yeah. to kind of uh, pretend that that code will work for multiple types, right? So there are sort of uh, two types, but it is a little bit complicated. So for example, when Java initially came, came about, it didn't have generics. When Golang initially came about, it didn't have generics uh, and so on, because it is kind of difficult to have um, a language with generics. But we as programmers, we kind of like it. All right, so let's do one more. Arithmetic operations, give me some examples of arithmetic operations. Yep. Plus. <laughs> yeah. Add the adding things, uh, multiplying things, uh, doing modulo. Those are all arithmetic operations. Give me some logic operations. Yes. Yeah, some examples. Or, and, not, yeah. If. Uh, yeah. No, if not. If, if is not a logical operation. <laughs> If is control flow operation, right? So give me more control flow flow operations. Else. If else, yeah. More for while case switch. All right. So Expression. Give me an example of an expression. Two plus two. two, plus two. Yeah. What is the deal with expressions? Well, the deal with expressions is that you have a concept of statement and you have a concept of expression. So give me an example of a statement. If, who, who said if, yeah. So if is an, a very good example to discuss. So if, I'll say with small i, in C and C++, this is a statement, right? So whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, and it's a statement and it's a kind of a control flow statement as well, right? Uh, in some languages, if is actually an expression because you can say V equals if blah, 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 right? So if, you know, if true, then this value v1 else v2, right? And then if I do this, then v will be either v1 or v2, depending on the, on the condition, right? In some languages, you can do that. And if is an expression, if is not a statement. In some languages, you cannot do that. And then if is a statement, right? Um, so typically, languages which are favoring expressions are much more powerful and much easier to work with. Uh, they are much more expressive than languages that favor statements because uh, every time you have a statement, you cannot chain statements, right? There is a, a an expression you can say one plus two, but you can also say one plus two, multiply it by 10 and you can use braces and you can build it, right? In statements, you cannot do that in a single line. In a statement, you can only have one sort of statement per line. Uh, you cannot combine kind of uh, multiple things together that easily, right? With expressions, you can. You can kind of uh, combine them the way you want. So you will learn that uh, some languages are very expressive because they kind of express everything via expressions. And some languages are kind of more limited because they opted in to have certain things as statements, right? All right, final one, polymorphism. Again, kind of a difficult concept. What is polymorphism? You should know it from object-oriented programming. You had polymorphic functions, right? So if I have a, uh, a person class, and it has um, some method, let's say salary, right? 
uh, and then the default person salary is like a abstract method. It doesn't do anything because the person doesn't have a salary, right? Um, so then I have a student and I have, a, oh, I have a teaching assistant and I have a, a teacher as a subclasses, right? Uh, and then I call, I have an instance and I call salary. Uh, so depending whether it's a teacher or a teaching assistant, it may have a different implementation. It, it kind of calculates the tax differently, right? Um, so my function salary is the same function, but it, the behavior is depends on the type which is passed to it, right? So the, if I'm calculating a salary for a teaching assistant, I may have a different behavior than for the lecturer, right? Um, so polymorphism is the ability to do different behavior based on the types that we are passing in to, to, to do the behavior um, in an abstract sense. You, you do have polymorphic functions without object-oriented programming. You don't need it. But in C++, you're doing it by this kind of a virtual functions, right? So virtual functions kind of give you kind of a functional polymorphism in, in C++, right? All right, so let's stop here. Uh, I will uh, let you go to your next class. And then those of you who want to meet, uh, we will meet in uh, 255. But there will be no lecture. The next lecture will be next Friday. Uh, and what we will do is we will install and test uh, Rust and Haskell installations for you. Thank you. Yes. Yep. A quick question on retaking this course.